Pete is back here with us singing a great song called
You know, I, it was a shock to me, okay? It was a shock, but it's, it's not, it's not. But we're going to talk about the three R's of God this morning. Uh, and one of the main words is revival. We keep talking about revival. We keep looking for revival. But what are we doing about revival? Do you know that we have a hand to play in revival? We really do. We're, we're going we're gonna to see Jonah's hand. And, and listen, we, we see 3,000 saved at the day of Pentecost in the Word. We've seen 5,000 saved at a later date when Peter preached in the temple. But listen. Over a million people were saved at the preaching of Jonah because he listened. Oh, listen, he didn't listen right off the bat, right? Sometimes we don't correspond to what God wants us to do. Sometimes we'll run from a call. But see, this calling ain't about you or it ain't about me. It's about His work. Okay? And we, anytime we lose a focus off of what God really is calling the church to do, listen, when He's hanging on the cross, He only hung there for one reason. That's for our salvation. Listen, you can you can get a healing by his stripes. Listen, the blind man got healed in in the early church, right? The lame man stood up at Gate Beautiful and he walked, right? But they're dead. Dead physically, alive spiritually for every moment. Right? So we see the eternal thing that's going to last, the eternal thing that's important is what we need to focus on, and that is the saving of Oak Hill, West Virginia, and Beckley, West Virginia, and Somersville, West Virginia. And let's not, let's not limit it to the, to, to the outskirts of this city. God is far-reaching. We, we learned on Wednesday night's Bible study, Paul had a great vision. He says, I'm like a light in the middle of a, of a, of a country, and, and God is just shining His light, not just like a light in the room, but He shined His light throughout the country. Wherever, far-reaching, to the ends of the world. That's God's salvation. Only we limited that. Right? Okay. So let's go ahead and start reading in Jonah. Um, let's, I'm going to stay right here for a minute. There, there's three things revival is. And, and, and the church really has some hard problems in some point. First, revival is upwards. Me and God. Me, personally. Me and God personally. Revival. I need to be revived personally. And then we see a corporate revival inwardly. In the church. Alright, here's where we get stuck. See, the focus, the Lord is filling us and getting us ready to be sent out to a lost and dying world, go out to the highways and the byways and compel them to come in, but instead we get focused in the body. Bless me, Lord. Right? We get we change God's purpose and focus. Because you know what? You're already blessed. You're already blessed with all spiritual and heavenly blessings. Amen? Amen. That's what you are. So you're benefiting from all God's benefits through His Word, through His promises of His blood. So what happens is we get diverted. And then all of a sudden, it's about me, it's not about He. It's about me, it's not about He. Right? So what we need to do, we got to deal with See, I've been praying a long time about this because I'm like, Lord, I feel revival in my soul all the time. I'm alive. I'm alive about what God is doing in me. Amen. I'm about. I'm alive about His saving grace. Yes. I'm not dead. Amen. And, and when this body gets done with this job, I'm going to move on to a better life. I'm never going to die. Amen? So i got to get the focus off of me. It's about that lost person. When they stand there and scream and say, No, I don't want to go there, but, but I, my name ain't in the book and nobody told me. What's, what's going to be important, church? Revival. Revival of you and your Savior and revival of that lost person bring back from the dead. He says, you were once dead in your trespasses, but now you're alive in Christ. And by saved, by grace you're saved. What's important? And Jonah lost his focus. I want my way, Lord. I want something going on in my life. I want my own decision. I'm my own man. And Jonah was very wrong in his thinking because he, the Bible says you were bought with the price. That's right. You don't belong to yourself. You're not your own anymore. You belong to Him. Amen? I belong to Him. This preaching's for me. It hurts me. I'm like, Lord, help me not to be self-centered. This is not a selfish religion. This is a giving religion. It's a forgiving religion. Amen? Amen. It's a forgiving salvation. Amen. We, we, are we going to get to the first point or not? <laughs> am I doing okay? If I'm doing okay, just say amen. Amen. Okay, okay. Anyway, um, we see that revival is upward, inward, and outward. And outward is the most important part about revival. Outward means it goes from the inside and reaches out. 
Not a spirit of deadness. Not a spirit of just saying you've got religion. But actually an outer showing of salvation in Jesus' love to the lost and dying world. Making a difference. Amen? He says he that went souls is wise. Who, who would like to be wise in the Lord's eyes? I would. You know, you know why he's wise? Because he hasn't lost his focus. He never lost his focus. Let's go, let's go to Jonah. Now, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Midia, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose and fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Well, he went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. Isn't that interesting? Do you know you're going to pay the fare if you don't go God's way? Do you know you're going to pay? You wonder why our lives are in a, in a turmoil and mess, and, and, and you know that what you're doing is not corresponding to what God has called you to do. And there's going to and see. We are we are spiritual beings. We're not physical and human beings. But we, we we we're looking for a a city that His Maker and Builder is God. Right? We're aliens in this land. So we see when we don't correspond to God's will, there's friction in the spiritual realm, which causes us our our life rocks and rolls. Then, don't it? You ever been there? So is Jonah. So have I. But anyway, you have to pay the devil's fare if you're not going to go God's way. And it says, uh, he went to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Do you think he left the presence of the Lord? There was, there, there was some reasons why Jonah didn't want to go to, to uh, Nineveh. He's, oh, oh, it was the way they treated their enemies. God wanted them to go there because they were very wicked. They filleted their enemies alive. They buried them in the ground up to their head and left them to die. They... They took them and held them over stakes, sharpened stakes in the ground and dropped them. They were very, very cruel. They were heartless. They had no heart. And not only that, but uh, Israel was part of their enemy, part of their territory. And, and they, were, they were very fearful of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Assyria was very cruel. Assyrian people were very cruel. So not only did Jonah maybe fear but he says, you know, maybe if God destroys them stinking people, I won't have to put up with them anymore. Amen? Amen. Ain't that a good attitude of a Christian, ain't it? Huh? You know, they're, they're pretty worthless anyway. Why would God want to save people like that? He saved us, didn't he? That's right. When we walked according to the lust of this world, He saved us. Amen. God intervened and showed His mercy. Okay? He said that uh, Jonah was... Uh, Jonah, here, here's where a uh, Christian, we, we have trouble here. We, we, we have trouble separating the natural viewpoint of man and the spiritual viewpoint of God. See, because if we look at our situations and troubles that we're in, if we can look down the end of the road and see that God has an almighty purpose in what's going on. See, our life goes like this, but God goes like this. And down at the end of the road, if we can, if we can just not focus on this roller coaster circumstance that we're in, but focus on what God's purpose is in this thing, we can see that God's moving and He's going to do something in this. Amen? And it don't matter where you're at. If you can look past your circumstance and look to God, what, what's going to, what if the trumpet sounds before the service is over? What's it going to matter? Amen? You're going to leave this trouble behind. Right. Yeah. Right, that's the end of the road. And then we read about it many times the devil being cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and there he's going to be with the false prophets forever and ever. He's done. And, 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 and we won't have the tempter and the deceiver and, and the accuser of the brethren around anymore. Amen? Amen? There's a time coming like that, and we got to hold on to the hope. And we see that if, if the Lord told you to go to Nineveh Street, what, what if the Lord told you to go to Nineveh Street? How would you react? You know where Nineveh Street is? Nineveh Street's preaching for me. He said, go, go preach. Lord, you know, and then, then a long line of excuses, right? Well, I don't want to do that. Nineveh Street might be going to a bad neighborhood and witnessing how I down track. Nineveh Street might be reaching that drug dealer that you can't stand, that you know are selling drugs to kids. Why would God want to just let God destroy that stinking person? Amen? Just let God have His way. Let God just reach in there and just crunch him. That was, that, that was Jonah's idea of, of Nineveh. Let God go ahead and get rid of them. They're nuisance. They're mean. But we see that God did a wonderful work in Nineveh. 
The homosexual might be Nineveh Street for you. God wants to save that homosexual. He, he, he's in bondage and you have freedom. You, you got like he's in prison, you got like the key to open the door. Or she. You, evil people, Satan worshipers. God cares for all people. And that's the focus of the church. God cares for people. Okay? It says that we are like Jonah running from God's purpose. Or, or running the opposite way. Tarshish was 2,000 miles from where, from where Jonah started. Nineveh was only 500 miles away. He was supposed to go on an overland trip. And then he took a boat. <laughs> Don't we do that? Man, I mean, when I was reading this, I'm like, Lord, help me. How many times I took a boat when you told me to take, take off walking? Or how many times I take off walk when you told me to do something else? But Lord, I don't want to do that right now. I, you know, that ministry, uh, right? Is that the way we are? Listen, there's a greater purpose in what God's calling you to do than just you making a decision, yes or no. You're going to affect every person that you come in contact with because of the, the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Amen? Okay, let's go ahead and... Uh, we find out when sometimes things aren't working out, it's because we lost the purpose of God. And I, this is what really, really grasps me. It says that we're going to read about in the first Lord. We always blame the devil on everything that's happened to us, don't we? Devil, I'm tired of you in my house. But still, you pick on your wife constantly. Devil, I'm tired of my husband treating me like this. But you started the argument. I'll leave that. Okay. I want you to read verse 4. It, it, it say, but the Lord. That's what, how it starts. Who, who sent it? But the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken. See, Jonah's circumstance had nothing to do with the devil. Do you, do you see the, the, the physical complications to spiritual circumstances? When God wants you to do something, you're, you're going to feel the effects of going the opposite way. Your ship is going to rock and roll. Amen? Amen. You're going to think the devil, the hell broke loose of the house and you don't know what to do. What you need to do, we're going to learn what Jonah did and it's the same track we need to take. Amen? Let's, let's drop down to verse 9. It says that, So he said to them, now, now, what had happened? The, the ship was moving and they rock and roll and they come to him and say, listen, who are you, old sleeper? Arise and tell us about yourself. We've cast lots and the lots fell on you. That's why this storm is ready to take us under. He says, who are you? And he said, he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made sea and the dry land. And then... They did everything in their power because, you know, they figured if God raised a storm like this, the guys on the ship didn't want to make him any mad. So they tried their best to save him. They rode, they, they toiled, they threw things overboard, but yet nothing worked. The sea even grew worse. And Jonah finally said, hey, listen. And this is where Jonah really turned his heart. He said, listen, throw me overboard and it'll be okay. Do you understand? That's all God wanted in the first place. Sacrifice for people you don't care about. Jonah could care less about the guys on the ship because they were native to him anyway. They were just like the Ninevites. They didn't belong in the Jewish crowd or the Jew. Hey, the people don't belong in church. What do we want to do anything with them for? Why would I give my life for those people? Why would Jesus give his life for those people? And that's what Jonah says. He got to that point to say, I'm ready to give my life so we can save them. Throw me overboard and it'd be okay. He gave his life. That's what the ship crew would suppose that happened. Verse 11. Uh, let, let, let's, let, let's just cap this. We'll just, we're just going to call this point one. And uh, we see rebellion in Jonah. And that's, where, that's why Jonah, it comes down to one word. And, and this one word surfaces time and time again in the Word of God. This one word is part of our intellect and personality. This one word hinders us from a direct and powerful relationship with God. 
And rebellion is, I want my way. Let me tell you what Webster says about rebellion. And I find it so interesting when the secular realm says something about the spiritual realm. It says rebellion is a spirit of resistance to authority. God, the ultimate authority, he was rebelling. It says that resisting control is rebellion. And it says it's a spirit. Webster says it's a spirit. How much more do we as Christians know it's a spirit? Just like the spirit of fear. Sometimes it ain't just fear that's got a hold of it. It's spirit. It says you don't have a spirit of fear but of love and power and self-discipline. Self-control. So we see sometimes the toxic we're under don't have to do with the physical at all. There's something spiritual happening. So that rebellion you have may not just be just a little resentment that maybe you've you've come up with in your family and you know my dad he he you know this might be an excuse uh, my dad he was he was sort of rebellious to authority he sort of put that in me but listen when you're when you're when you're saved God will take that out because you'll never accomplish the purposes and will of God being rebellious because you'll always want your way and you'll always come against what is going on amen amen, amen. that this applies to me I mean this this whole, this whole thing the Lord just spoke to me right through it I mean, if I'm going to really have revival, I'm having revival in word on a daily basis. But if I'm really going to accomplish the revival God wants, it's outward. And until I get rid of my rebellion, I'll never reach that loss. I'll never, I'll never work in the capacity of the Holy Spirit that He wants me to work in. Okay, uh, verse 17. Now the Lord prepared a fish. Now say the Lord prepared a fish. All right, now we've got two things the Lord's prepared already. You know, Jonah's having a real bad day. I mean, not only, you know, he finally said, okay, Lord, just have him throw me overboard in the sea. But then, can you imagine once you hit the water and, and, and it just calms down, you think, well, maybe, maybe I'll live. And then you look over and you see the fish coming. <laughs> it's not a good day. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, that's just, that's just about the worst thing that you can think to happen. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, I can swim for it. The water's calm. You know, it's, it's, he's just having a real bad day. Anyway, I, I read some read some things about this fish, and only there was only one account where a fish ever swallowed a man whole, and that was uh, that was not a documented account. It was a hearsay account, so I, I have trouble going with it. That was a sperm whale where the man was recovered alive after several days. But see, it don't say that a whale in anywhere in the world that well done. It said God prepared fish. God prepared fish. So it was probably something maybe never even been made before. God made it. Amen. He made it specifically for a purpose. That fish only had one purpose. He probably hung around and he, he probably waited around all his little life and he grew up to a great big fish and he had one purpose of God and that's what the snatch Jonah when he come off the boat. Amen. You got one purpose. You got one purpose. When you see the devil working in people's lives, it's the snatch in him when, when Satan says, I'm done with them and they're no good for nothing. And, he, and, and we should be like that fish that God prepared and said, hold on. There's a place God can use you. There's a place where you can be saved and have peace. That's, that surpasses all understanding. So we see that we see that even the fish had a purpose. The storm had a purpose. The fish had a purpose in revival. So that fish waited around all his life and he followed behind that boat and he's like, ooh, here comes suffering. <laughs> I'm waiting. God prepared me for this time and place. Right now, I'm waiting. Well, we ought to be that attentive too, huh? To God's purpose. Okay. Here he comes over. Bam! Right? And Jonah's like, it can't get any worse than this. But he was wrong. You know, because he's there three days in digestive juices that was eating away in his skin and his clothes. It wasn't a pleasant place. You know, and, and, we, and it goes right back to the show. So when we get out of the will of God, we find ourselves in very bad circumstances, don't we? It's not a, and the devil, you think, is really trying to digest you, right? <laughs> you think the devil has got you totally right where he wants you, but he's wrong. But God intervenes. Okay, let's go ahead and, and, and we'll go to chapter, uh, chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord and, and said from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried to the Lord because of my affliction, and He answered me. Now, 
You know, it's bad to be afflicted, ain't it? You know, it's worse to be self-afflicted. He's, he was self-afflicted. Sometimes we afflict our very selves. And we can't figure, what in the world's going on here? Why am I afflicted? And then most of the time you can trace it back to a choice about a month or two ago. Self-inflicted. But you know God still hears and He still cares and He'll still change the situation. He sure will. If He's done it for one person in the world, He'll do it for any person. Because we have a purpose. What's our purpose? We'll get to that in a minute. It says that... I'm, I'm going to go ahead and we're going we're gonna to skip down to uh, uh, verse 8. I know we're skipping a lot, but we're, we're, we're working towards a, a point here. Uh, though, those who... Now, you know, this is in his prayer. He says, Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pray. I, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish that he had prepared. And, and it vomited Jonah on dry ground. I mean, yeah, I, I love the Word of God. It just gets to the point like it's... It, Vomited him up, you know. It wasn't like, you know, it's hard to tell what come up with Jonah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it wasn't. It probably wasn't pleasant. This whole experience was very unpleasant. But we see that when we, when we, when, this is the second point about repentance. See, there's a way out of your situation, circumstance, because God will speak to your circumstance once you get your heart right. He repented and said, "Listen, I'm going to be about your saving work." I'm going, to do, I'm going to do what I vow to do because when you come and got saved, you said, Lord, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. You made a vow. You made a vow to, to dedicate yourself totally to God's purposes. Are, are y'all with me? Amen? Okay. 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 Stay with me now. Uh, but repentance. Now, I'll, repentance is... This is out of the Greek. It's a twofold meaning. It says, it's a change of mind that results in a change of action. I repent of the way that I have felt about the loss. I repent that my burden wasn't what God wanted it to be for the loss. So now my actions will change. I repent because I've run away from the ministry call that I have. Now my actions should correspond to my repentance. Right? So we see, look in verse 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I, I will tell you. Now, sec, second point. Did repentance change God's plans? See, Jonah went inward right here. He went inward. He didn't spin his wheels there, though, because God's plans still, and purposes and will still didn't change. And that's the way we are. And we can repent, Lord, I just haven't been what you wanted me to do. But then... The Lord stands by and waits on the action to prove what you have repented. Are you going to do what you said you was going to do? Yes. Aren't you? Amen. Amen. Right? Okay, so we see that re repentance also results in a change of action of God. And we're going to see that happen to Nineveh. Because they were on the road to destruction. I mean literal destruction. And because of, of what they, what, how they received the Word of God, it changes God's action. He pulled him out of a big mess. Amen. Now let's go ahead and, and we're going to let's go ahead and read verse three. Oh, we already did chapter three, verse one. Let's go ahead and get, go down. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read a few verses here. Uh, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. And, and I want I want to make this point to you. What was so great about Nineveh? They were the most rebellious, cantankerous people on earth. They were they were cruel and mean, and 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 to the human nature, to the human viewpoint, they were worthless to God. What was so great about it? You know what was great? There was over a million people involved in this plan that God had. How many people's involved in the plan He's got for Oak Hill right in this area right here? Here. How many people's involved in the plan that God has? How many of us are involved in that plan? Every one of us. No one excluded. We all have a purpose. Okay, it says that it was a great city. And he said, go to it and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city and a three days journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city on the first day walk. How, how many know you'll get in a hurry when you get serious with God? Three days away. Now it wasn't like that he got on Route 79 and went north. You know, instead of driving 60 miles an hour, he drove 100 miles an hour to get there. Three days journey, 
one day it took him to get there. He was excited about what God was ready to do. Lord, I, I'm glad to be vomited up. I'm glad that you saved me and set me on dry land. And I want to get about what you want me to do because I don't want to mess around with that fish anymore. <laughs> right? I'm done with the fish thing. I'm, I, you know, how far does the Lord have to take us before we get done? How, how far? How far does He have to take us before we'll start fulfilling the ministry of God? And see, that's the thing about discernment. Right now, you're discerning something in each one of your hearts. What does God say to me? It's different for every one of us. But He's saying something. It's, and it says that Jonah began to enter into the city on the first day of the walk. And then he cried out and said, this is, and this is eight words, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed the fast and put on sack and sackcloth for the, the, the greatness, from the greatest to the least of them. So th this is the turning point for revival. It's when you get revived and it stay in a state of revival. Because you're, you're revived. Uh, revived means you have been brought back from the dead. You're revived. You're in a constant state of revival and refreshment, right? Now the idea is to go somewhere and revive somebody else. That's the purpose of God. Was the purpose of God to make a storm? No. Was the purpose of God to make a fish? No. Was the purpose of God to reconcile the loss after you get reconciled? Yes. That was the whole purpose. And, and look how far Jonah had to drive to get there. And then he had to walk real fast too and run probably a long way because he got there in one day. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and... and uh, <coughs> How is Jonah's ministry and my ministry alike? I, 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 I just need to turn quickly to 2 Corinthians 5. Flesh always gets on me on this point because I always get my verses and chapters mixed up. So if I say 2 Corinthians 5, chapters, uh, verses 17, you might want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 17, verse 5. But it's actually, it's actually what I said. It's, it's chapter... 5, verse uh, 17, 18 through 19. If you're there, say amen. 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 Alright, now this is this is the will of God. I'm talking to you specifically about the will of God, the purpose and will of His call. Okay? Listen to what it says. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Who's he talking to? Right? The same. Now listen to this. He says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of what? What has He given you? Who gave it to you? Are you confused about your ministry yet? You shouldn't be. Right here tells you what our ministry is. What is our ministry? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Listen to this. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and that He had committed us to the Word of... So what's your ministry? You're waiting, so you don't have to be confused anymore. Lord, I don't have a ministry. Lord, I don't know where You want me. Now you do. If you have no other, if you have no other inkling of a calling, you're called the reconciliation of the lost. Through, through your reconciliation, you'll reconcile someone else. Amen? Amen. Let's go on. It says, uh, let's go back to Jonah. It says that then God, in, in verse 10, chapter, chapter 3, then God saw their works and they turned from their evil ways and God relented from the disaster that He had said He would put and bring upon them. And He did it not. Okay, so God saw their works. Now that's that's the thing about repentance. What's going to happen when you repent? You're going to say, what? You're going to change your mind, and then what's going to happen? You're going to change your actions, right? That's repent. That's really true repentance. It's more than just a mindset. It's a it's actually an outward change of being a new creature. Okay, it says, and and we, we also we also saw repentance. What stops judgment and releases mercy? Praise God. That's what revival does too. 
It stops judgment. Now, I'll tell you, this world is about ready to be judged. It is on the verge of judgment. Oak Hill is on the verge of judgment. And the only thing that's going to help Oak Hill is a release of mercy. Mercy has been released. So what what keeps mercy from, from moving like it could and being operated like it could? It stops the messengers. Messengers. Messengers get in. They get they lose their focus and purpose of God's perfect will. And our, his will is a will uh, and a purpose of reconciliation in, of the ministry. Reconciling the lost to him. That's his whole purpose. When we stand before the Lord on judgment day, that will be the thing. Okay? Let's go ahead and go to down to, we're going to go to chapter chapter four. Verse 6, it says that, And the Lord God prepared a plan. Who prepared the plan? Now at this point, Jonah went outside the city. He went in and preached his eight-word message. And our whole city repented. They got in sackcloth and ashes. And they had a fast from every beast. Couldn't eat. Nobody could drink water. Everybody fasted. Every baby, every small animal, everything that was in that city fasted and repented. And said they were sorry. But, but God, let me get back for a minute. But God prepared a plan. And Jonah was sitting outside the city. Well, I've done what you wanted me to do, God. Now, go ahead and destroy him. <laughs> you know, it's better for me to die than live in this ministry you called me in. I would rather be dead. Look in verse 5. It's what it says. I would rather be dead than have to suffer this. Feeling sorry for yourself, wasn't you? Now, God, let me see you really move. Just destroy it. Put it on him, Lord. God prepared a plan. In verse 7, it says, As the morning drew, uh, as the morning uh, dawned and the next day, God prepared a worm. Uh, now, see, here we go with Jonah again. You notice the attitude is just killing Jonah, ain't it? I mean, it's just killing him. You think people learn. It's the attitude. The change of heart and the repentant heart, but there should be a change of action and attitude. And he's like, you know, he's sitting under that shade. And it's, it's shading him, and man, it's hot. And Jonah got thankful for that plan. Thank you, Lord. That's why I'm sitting here watching those heathers be destroyed. I'll be in the shade. But then we see God prepared that word. God prepared it. And we always think it's the devil, don't we? It's the devil that cut that tree down. No, Jonah, you're getting too comfortable with that attitude. So we're going to cut the tree down. And it says, let's, let's read on to what it says. It says that, it says the tree weathered away. And in verse 8, and it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a hot east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head, and he grew faint. And he wished death for himself, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And it's all God's fault. <laughs> right? Ain't that, too, ain't that? It's the devil's fault, and I don't understand why God's letting me do that. And a lot of times, God's got us in circumstances to show you that He is your deliverer. But it's still yet, we we work in our own avenues and finagling around and going over here and doing it. And, and he says, no, no, I'm ready to do something wonderful and supernatural in your life. I'm ready to do a miracle for you. And you've got to let me work. And you've got to change your attitude so I can. Because if you do something with a bad attitude, you might as well say no to it. Okay. Where's that? Where's that? How much is 10%, honey? Here. <laughs> right? You might as well catch But you robbed God when you did. But I'll tell you what, God said he loved a cheerful people. He says, Ch change your attitude when you, when you give your, when you give it out. Give it because you know that, that this is helping the ministry and this is what God has told you to do. It's, it's part of the sin to the Lord. Amen? It is. Read it, Lord. It really is. So we see that, um, let's go back here, and it happened that God sent the wind. You know, God has prepared so much for Jonah, and still yet Jonah seems to always just reap the bad end of the deal it seems like to even to say man I'd rather be dead than have to face this stuff you know and look at in verse 9 it says and God said to Jonah is it right for you to be angry about the plant and he said it is right for me to be angry even unto death I'm so mad I, I, he passed spit and he wants to die right you ever hear somebody that I'm saying I can spit no I don't want to spit I want to just die 
You know, I'm so mad about that plant. That plant was my friend. <laughs> and the devil come and killed it. I have a right to be mad. And I'll tell you what, now that I'm mad, everybody in church going to know I'm mad. <laughs> Lord help us. Everybody's going to know I'm mad. How about letting everybody know you're saved? Amen. You want revival? It's a change of letting God go first and you go second. Yes, Me too. Amen. Verse 10. But the Lord said, You have heard, you have had pity on the plant, which you have not labored nor made to grow, but came up in a night and perished in a night. And, and what God was trying to do is Jonah was trying to change his heart. He says, Here, here this city that you had no hand in growth. You had no hand in the children. There was 120, over 120,000 children, children in the city. Livestock. And over a million in the circumference of the outreach and boundaries of, of what God was going to do in that city. But still yet, Jonah cared more about a plan that shady than he did about people going to hell. He lost his focus. And now all along, you know, no matter how God seems to work with us, at some point we have to give in. We can't be like Jonah. We can't be like Jonah and let make sure everybody knows how I feel about the situation. Let's let God, let's let everybody know how God feels about the situation. And I am guilty. I am. You know, I, I, I've had a bad attitude. Right? I mean, I'll sit down and I'll say, listen here, if it can't be my way, then, then I ain't moving. I'll show them, won't I? <laughs> won't I? Will I show you? The Bible says I better show you some love. The Bible says I better get a pan out and wash your feet because I'm your servant. Nobody wants to hear that, do they? You want to hear that? <laughs> okay. Amen. It's true anyway. Uh, and, and that's what he was trying to get Jonah to see, that he didn't do nothing to cause them to grow he, he, he didn't see the babies born. God had God knew every hair on the head of people in that city. Just because Jonah didn't like them didn't mean, mean they were worthless or unsavable or not worth saving. You, you there's people that you're going to meet this year, and I, I, I really think we're like we're like Judah. When, when the Lord looked at Judah and said, "Whatever you got to do, you better do it fast," because they're coming to get me tonight. They're going to hang me on the cross. This thing's over. I'm out of here. That's the same what he's saying to the church right now. Whatever you're going to do, you better be about His business, you better get the right attitude, and you better be in the will and purpose of God because this thing's about over and you're accountable. If you're going to do it, you've got to do it. Alan, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it. Do it now because this thing's about over. When a trumpet sounds, it's too late. However, a tree falls, that's the way it's going to lie. You can't turn a tree over after it falls. After that trumpet sounds, there's not going to be a chance to change. Look at the rich man in hell. Give me another chance, Lord. Let me go to my brother. What happened to you when I dealt with you on earth? You rejected me. It's too late. Yeah. Verse 11. And should I not have pity on Nineveh, the great city? And the great city was great because of all the people that God loved and cared about in it, which was more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and they have much livestock. The, group, the city was great because of the amount of people that were in it. And they can't discern. Did you know you were ignorant when you were lost? You know, you could help. we could help ourselves walk according to the flesh because we were propelled by the spirit of this world and, and the prince and power of the air. We were ignorant, weren't we? We, we? we were pitiful. But somebody come into your realm of influence and said, will you come to church with me? Or they said, hey, let me tell you about how you can be set free from that. Let me give you some hope that I found one time a long time ago. Somebody come along and, and talk to you. And in turn, you're supposed to be, they reconcile you to God through their reconciliation. And so in turn, are we supposed to reconcile people to God because Jesus reconciled us to Himself? Amen? What's our purpose? What is the church's revival? What is it? Revival is when we see we got to prop both doors open because they're pouring in right here and saying, Lord, forgive me because I don't have time to waste. i got to make things right. You're ready to blow the trumpet. And i got to get things right. There's an unrest in my spirit. And only in you I have rest. That's revival. That's revival. 
it, it ain't in nothing else we do. It's the saving of the soul. Jonah, it's not running from God. Jonah, it's not being swallowed by a fish. It, it's not being, it's not being all these things that I prepare for you. It's not in the plant. It's not in the worm. It's in the saving of Nineveh. I care about it. Why don't you care? Yes. Amen. Good preaching. We're accountable. With with accountability, it's linked to responsibility. We're responsible. Listen, it, it ain't just a me religion. When you got saved, you took on more than just me and just He. You took on them. Just like Jesus, He said, I took the whole world. He took the whole world to reconcile these, them to Himself. And you are full of grace. Praise God. It says, it says they can't deserve. They weren't innocent. Oh yeah, they weren't. But they were helpless. Listen, the world out here that we're facing right now, they don't know how to escape. No, they're not innocent. Some of them are devil worshippers. Some of them you think are Satan themselves. Some of them ridicule you and persecute you. But they're the ones that really respect you down inside for making a stand. You ever notice the old meanest ones around that seem to be the one that starts preaching? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But he says, who would love me the most? The one I forgave the most, I forgave the least. He forgave me for a multitude. He forgave me for more than I can stand here and talk to you about today. And I love him. So whatever he's called me to do, I'm going to go to the death if it does kill me. If it does, I still do. Because I've been called with a purpose. And the purpose ain't my own purpose, it's God's will and purpose. It's reconciling the law to itself. People that can't escape the bondage that they're in, you have the way of escape. Resting under your tongue and your heart. Right. Your revival comes with the price. We can go the long way and get it, but God has ordained. He has chosen every person from the foundation of the earth to be saved. They're ordained to be saved. You're not going out doing a new work. The work's already been done. All you're doing is doing, going out and laboring in the fields for the harvest. The harvest is already there. You didn't make it right. You didn't grow. God's just asking us to care about it. That's what He's asking us to do. Right there. This church, I've been in a lot of churches, and I just dearly love this church. Amen. And I really believe that God is going to do something in these last days in this church and on this body. And I, I hear Him prophesy about the little pews. And it will go unhindered if we keep our focus as a church. Unity. Unity is a church knowing that, listen, it might not seem real serious to you now, but when they're taking them and casting them into hell, and you're looking down and you see the, the blood on your hands, it becomes serious to him. It does. It really does. I'm going to close it today. Without the revival in a restored church, uh, this Oak Hill city that we're living in is condemned to hell. You know, Jonah had time, but I think we're running now. If you'll bow your heads with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit has testified in our hearts of your purpose and your will. And Lord, I pray that you would give a burning desire for us that we not wait on the person sitting beside of us to make a move in the calling that you've called us in. That we might not wait for the person on the other side of us to make a move. But Lord, I pray that we personally would make a move, Lord, to tear down what the devil is doing in our community and in our schools and in every system of government. The corruption that flows forth, Lord, it can be changed because we know that your judgment is hand. But, Lord, we know that repentance can change the judgment of God. And, Lord, that you'll give people a second chance, Lord. Lord, now, Lord, a lot of us are sitting here and we have a Jonah ministry going. Lord, you have prepared things for us and we have blamed it on the devil. Lord, you, you have prepared things for us and we try to get somebody else to, to get behind us. And, and, Lord, when you have called us, you have called us. There's many times, Lord, you have called us and we call somebody else to put it on somebody else's shoulder. But you have called us personally 
Lord, there's none of us made weak. It's by your spirit, and your spirit is powerful, working through the believer to the saving of the soul. Now, Lord, I pray for the, this church. Lord, because we know we see the fight of affliction, Lord, that comes with revival. But, Lord, I pray that we keep our focus. And, Lord, that we not be interrupted, that we not be hindered by any satanic power. But, Lord, that we would be focused on the lost, continually focused on changing people's eternity and spreading the good news of the gospel of hope. This morning, with every head bowed, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you a very personal question. Some of you have felt like you're an enemy. And there, you just feel like there, there has been no way of escape for you. There has been no peace for you. And you just feel like you're doomed. God is speaking to you this morning. Just like Nineveh, they had to change their mind and then change their actions. God is calling you to repentance this morning. If you want revival, it starts with self-repentance. It starts with restoring that relationship upward so you can restore that relationship outward. If you're lost this morning and you know you're lost, if, if, if you would leave these buildings tonight and before you got off the parking lot you were hitting the side and, and the ambulance came and there was no life in your body, where would your spiritual man wake up? You know the answer to that. And if you know the demons would surface from out of the earth and grab your soul and take you down to the pit where there's torment and the worm died not, if you know that's you, you can change that this morning. There's a book open and, there, and there's a pen ready and there's blood waiting to cover your sins as though they were scarlet to make them white as snow. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if that's you. If you just feel like there has been no escape for you and you, the devil has just had you going in circles in your life and you just want to change that. You just want to call out to God and say, Lord, change that in my life. I'm tired of the dead end road. I'm tired of the dry life. I'm tired of drawing the picture to think every time I get to a point in life, it's going to be okay. But it's always empty because I don't have the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ in my life. He wants to give you that living water this morning where you don't have to thirst anymore. You won't have to thirst anymore with this dry life. I'm going to ask you this morning, if that's you, would you raise your hand? The Bible says if you deny me before me and I'll deny you my Father. Don't deny him. We've denied him long enough. And listen, if you're sitting there in that situation, I sit there. And every person that's saved, sit in your seat. And, and the devil will come to you right now because there's a spiritual battle going on. He'll say, hey, if you raise your hand, you'll look like a fool. How are you going to look on judgment day? The devil, he's come to lie to you and steal what the Word of God has said to you. If this is you, if you're sitting in Nineveh this morning and you've heard the Word of the Lord and the message of the Lord has spoke to your heart and you says, there is hope in this land and it's through Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you raise your hand this morning? Praise the Lord. Church, for complete restoration in the Lord, we need revival upward and inward. We need to walk in a state of revival because you're not dead. You have been brought back from the dead. Amen. You are revived. Regardless, it's not a feeling. You are revived. You are already revived. You are raised and alive and seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're, it's already done. When you accept Jesus, you're on the other side of the, the resurrected tomb. Already. When you die, you pass from this life and go right into the next. There's no death for you. But if you're you as a Christian, could be honest and say, Lord, I just want to be restored so I can not only reconcile myself to you, but I want to reconcile others to you. I have a ministry now, I understand. If that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. That's being honest with God. That's the first step of faith. To say, that's me. That's me, Brother Allen. That's me. And this, this message has said something to me and I want to change. See, you already changed your mind. Now you got to change your act. you got to change and put it into action. Show yourself faithful. Because your circumstances, you just raised your hand, just now changed. The Lord is ready to put you up on the dry land, the solid rock. He's ready to change some of these circumstances you've been fighting because you have realized that I need God to restore me and revive me because I need to revive other people. And I've lost my focus. I've lost the purpose of God. And now i got it back. Amen? Amen. 
ask the church to stand on our feet this morning. I'm going to ask you if you'll come up and pray this morning, especially the ones that raise their hand. I'm not going to ask you to come up by yourself. I'm going to ask you to come up corporately. If that's you this morning, if you felt the Lord say, you know, maybe you've messed the focus a little bit. Maybe you've lost sight a little bit of what I've called you to do and your purpose for, for my calling and ministry. If, you, if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you to come. Please come. Because what, what you're doing, when you take that first step, you're saying, I'm starting to act on what I'm repenting of. I'm starting to act because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. I haven't accomplished the ministry that I was supposed to be accomplishing because I lost the focus. I've lost the idea of having a burden for the lost. But now I'm going to take a step. I'm, I'm building faith. I'm going. I'm going. I'm coming up here and I'm going to change things. From now on, when I leave, when I get done here, when I leave here, it's going to be different. Is that you this morning? Please come up and pray. Amen. God would have his way with my vocal cords and every being about me. Lord, I pray that the message of God that you want your people, this your sheep, to hear this morning would come forth unhindered by any dark power or spiritual principality that would try to have his way in this place because he is subject to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, Lord, I pray that your word would go forth with an anointing that would change lives, that would give us an understanding of your word. Lord, to set the, your people free, not only to set them free, but to set the ones they talk to free. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Brother Johnny, would you mind giving me a glass of water, please? Okay. Um, I'm sort of drying out this morning. Okay, so I want you to go with, to me with Matthew chapter 4. Listen, I know that I've been in Matthew. I was in Matthew Sunday night four last. I've been in Matthew again. And we're going to do Jesus, 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 Jesus. If you want to hear Paul, he's on Wednesday night. <laughs> Philippians, okay? So if you want to hear Paul, you come on out on Wednesday night and we'll do Paul. Okay? Yeah. Amen? It's a good Bible study. We need to learn the Word of God. There's going to be a time maybe when they come and take our Bibles away. And then what are we going to do? You better have something hidden down inside. Yes. Amen? Amen. The, Word of good is, uh, the Word of God is very good. Amen? <clears throat> okay, chapter. we're going to go to verse 1. Then Jesus was led... Is everybody with me? Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, this is what I was talking about a while ago. <coughs> that Jesus, it wasn't a stumbling into a situation. It was a direct encounter or trial or temptation face to face with the devil. It wasn't an accident. And see, we can learn about this because we all live there too, don't we? Anybody ever live? Man, I tell you, sometimes, I, you know, I don't have to ask why because I understand why that I'm there. Thank you, brother. I understand the temptation and why that I'm there. And, and today when we leave, I hope everybody understands the temptation. Anybody ever been tempted here? Okay. We're on the right track. I know this is from the Lord. Before you can understand why Jesus was tempted and why we are tempted, we have to understand the word tempted. Okay? There's a twofold meaning to the word tempted. The word tempted means to be solicited. Anybody ever been solicited by the devil? Now listen, I want to tell you, he don't have the power to make you do anything. He only has the power to give you the advertisement. It's up to us to stand against the wiles of Satan and his temptations and say, no, I am bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a child of the king. I'll act like a child of a king. I'll walk like a child of a king. I'll be the child of a king when he comes against me. Amen? Amen. That's good. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's the way i got to be. That's the way I want to be in my own life. I will not fall to the advertisement say or his powerful suggestions. These are not wimpy suggestions. Amen? He don't come to you with a wimpy idea. He comes to you right in your weakness. You know how come I know that? That's the way he does it. Amen. He does us all that way. But the second part of this temptation, I like this part, is to test or prove. Now, here's our choices in temptation. 
The devil comes to test. The devil comes to solicit you with his advertisements and strong suggestions. It's up to us now. Will we test as a child of God and prove his word and prove his spirit is living abundantly in us? And we, we're living the full life, not a half full life. We're li we're, when that temptation comes, we're saying, listen, i got the power of the Holy Spirit. Do we understand what the power of the Holy Spirit does? Holy Spirit, when God said, let there be light, and it says there was light, what made that light? <clears throat> when God said, part the waters from the ground, and the waters were parted, the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> right? So how much more can the Holy Spirit have the power to part us from sin? Hallelujah. How much more if we allow Him to work? See, there was no resistance. Satan just bowed down and got out of the way because the earth was void without form. He had control. He had control. And then all of a sudden the Spirit of God moved in. And you ever wonder why? It says in Genesis first, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then like on the fourth day, he made the stars and the moon. What was the light? It was His Spirit. We are children of the light. We, through His power, are able to conquer sin. He conquered sin, gave us the authority. Yes. Amen? It's up to us. We, hey, we, it's time that we... Listen, the sin age was over when Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was. It was over. Aren't you tired of sin? I am just fed up with it. I'm fed up. And the only way that I can get, un, the only way that I can get rid of it is to know the Word. However, why am I being solicited? It's because God has tested and proven me. The devil... I'm going to show him one more time what a blood-bought, spirit-filled child of God can do. Amen. That's up to us. Yes. You're the blood-bought, spirit-filled child of God. Amen. 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 It's good news. Amen. Yeah. Now listen, from Satan's standpoint, he was trying to entice Jesus to sin. Now, man, this right here, we could go like 10,000 miles in 10,000 different directions. Could Jesus really sin? He was the Son of God. If He couldn't sin, why was He tempted? But we're not even going to go there. He was tempted. He was enticed. He did not sin. Amen. He was found yet without sin. Yes. Amen. He was perfect. The Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. But from Jesus' standpoint, Satan's, ass, uh, uh, state, Satan's standpoint, He was enticed to sin. From Jesus' standpoint, <coughs> it was... He had in his mind, here's Jesus' standpoint, he says he, he, that, that he would not be allowed, Satan would not be allowed to stop the Father's plan for his life. What was, what was Jesus, what was the Father's plan for Jesus? Listen, God was the, the maker and author of the plan. Jesus Christ was the fulfiller of the plan. What did he say? I didn't come to destroy the law. I come to fulfill every word. Every dot, every eye, every dot of every I, every T will be crossed. The word will be totally fulfilled when I'm done with this thing. I am the Lamb of God. I am the one that's going to fulfill all the promises. Yes. Without me fulfilling them, you'll be lost. You have no hope. So this we see this is really a direct temptation of salvation. This whole, this whole, this whole idea of Satan tempting God, uh, Jesus, and we're going to get into this and, uh, and chase this idea. Satan would not be allowed to hinder or stop God's ministry. Now, this is where we fail really big. The first time we were hindered or tempted and we fail, what do we want to do? Quit. What's there to go back to? Yeah, listen, some of these things are hard. They are. And, you know, Jesus preached that He was the bread. Unless you eat of me, uh, you, won't, you won't have no part of me. Unless you drink of my blood, you won't. But, and the, a lot of disciples walked away. And Peter looked. And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, are you also going to leave me? He said, where else is there to go? We, we, are, we are convinced you have the words of eternal life. Amen. Where else is there to go? Let's just do God's word. It's not hard. That's See, it's hard when we try it on our own. When God fills us with His Holy Spirit and we walk spirit-filled, not walking in the lust of the flesh. The lust of saying, oh boy, look at me, man. I did good, Brother Jim. I just overcome all them temptations. I'm the best Christian you've ever seen. That's not what it's about. It's to show the devil and all hell one more time that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is in control of His people. Amen. 
We're not going to quit. We got a job to do. We got a plan to fulfill. You got a personal plan to fulfill for your ministry in your life. And see, they, here comes Satan trying to tempt us and solicit, solicit us. We won't let that happen. We won't let that happen. Satan will not stop our ministries. Amen? Amen. There's people's souls on the line that we don't realize. People are still dying and going to hell every day. Jesus, I heard one of my sisters say the other day, they were talking, we were talking about the coming of the Lord. She said, Jesus is coming for somebody today. He is somebody yeah. will meet the Lord today. Yeah. Jesus, have we met that person? Have, have, we should, have we been the example of a spirit-filled Christian? We are the light. We are tools of grace. There's responsibility and accountability. Amen. Amen. There really is. From uh, Jesus' standpoint, that he would be not tempted out of his birthright. Now, I was reminded of Esau. He came in hunting from hunting one day and he was so hungry. He looked at his brother and said, Man, just give me some of them beans. Right? And for a bowl of beans, Esau gave up his birthright. He says, and Jacob says, well, give me your birthright for these bowl of beans. And he, was, he says, what will my birthright do me if I die of starvation? Yeah. How many knows we ain't starve to death? Yeah. Huh? I was sort of looking forward to Y2K because, you know, I figured I could lose some weight on this family of beans. <laughs> we can afford to lose some weight. We can, we can afford to go without a little bit. Amen. Amen. Jesus says, but Esau wouldn't. Esau wouldn't have it. He traded his birthright. We will not. We have to have our mind. This is a mindset. You have to have your mind made up. I will not quit my ministry. I will not be cheated out of my birthright. I will not fall to solicitations of the devil. Because listen, you've got to have your mind made up because it's coming. We, we know these things are coming. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um. Being spirit-filled and spirit-led allows us to be victorious over temptation just like Jesus was. Now, how do I know that Jesus was spirit-filled and spirit-led? It happened right before chapter 4, in verse 15, 16, 17. That's where he was baptized. He was put down in the water. He was raised by the water. And the spirit descended on him like a dove. And then all of a sudden, this, this driving of the spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. A face-to-face face off with Satan himself. <laughs> when your spirit filled, guess what? He didn't feel you to sit on the bench. That's right. Amen. Yeah. It means you're ready for battle. Yeah. Oh, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I, you know, I just prayed at the altar and I just received the baptism and, and I just feel so full of His Spirit and I just walk and talk to Jesus that I don't understand. Understand. Understand the battle. Jesus is wanting you to prove Him in your life. Just tell Satan, I'm a child of God. You're defeated. I'm victorious because my Father's victorious. Amen. 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 <laughs> now, I love this because this was the first time that Satan experienced a spirit-filled man of God. He was God, wrapped in flesh. But it was the first time that he was ever defeated that way. Now, look how many times he's been defeated since then by spirit-filled Christians. Yeah. Spirit-filled Christian says, no, I'm not going to fall to that. No, I'm not getting involved in this. Yes, I'm getting out of that. Yes, I'm getting out of this because I want to walk like Jesus. I want to talk like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to go to the places Jesus would go. I want to come from where He would come from. And that way, I can reach the people that He has a plan for me to reach. We all have a ministry. There are people that you talk to that your preacher will never talk to. There are people that I talk to that you'll never talk to. We, we all have our little missionary world, don't we? Yeah. Amen. Let's, let's reach in spirit feeding. Yeah. Let's not reach them. You know, it's sad when they always try to justify themselves anyway. You know, it's sad when we give them calls to justify themselves. Well, you call yourself, well, you're doing this and you're doing that. And you want me to... They don't understand the forgiveness that we understand. They don't understand how the blood covers our sins and forgives us. They don't understand that. They just understand accusations. Because they're the, the devil. That's right. That's what Jesus said. He says, it's your father the devil. It's either you sit at one table or the other, right? Is that an amen? 
You sit at the master's table, you sit at Satan's table. There's no in-between table. There's no gray table. It's a black and white table. You either sit at the light table or you sit at the dark table. I had a man tell me on the phone the other day, I, I was talking to him about church, and he says, uh, well, I don't go to church or nothing, but I'm not a sinner. That's the first one I ever met. <laughs> I like that. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's where we, we really reach people. Is where, first of all, I realized I was a sinner and I needed a Savior. You see, they don't need, people don't need me. They need the Savior I have. Yes. Amen. But they need me to set my Savior's example. To fulfill my plan. I got a plan. You got a plan? <coughs> Amen. God's got a plan for you. All right. Now that we understand temptation a little bit, we won't have to ask next time, why am I in the middle of this? Why? And, and I mean, next time you feel directly led into a temptation, you can say, I know why I'm here, and I know how I'm going to handle it. I know why I'm here, and I know that the devil's trying to test me, but I'm going to prove myself. To, to, to hell and the Lord because I have the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he hungered. Now when the tempter came, now when the solicitor, the snake, the tempter, the advertiser came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be turned to bread. All right? Satan tries to take advantages of our weaknesses. We've already discussed this. Why was what was Jesus' weakness? He was a man. He hadn't eaten for forty days. What would your weakness be? I'm hungry. I think I'll just wheel up there at McDonald's and and this, this is some of the advertisements that gets us too. This is McDonald's signs. You know, ninety nine cent waffle or ninety nine cent uh, quarter pounder of cheese. And you know, and the devil. We we know we look up there and we know we shouldn't be eating it anyway. And and we and we look up there and we. <laughs> You've been solicited. <laughs> Amen. But let me tell you what happens. About 45 years old, we come up and we start praying for heart disease. Because we've been solicited for years by our food that we eat. See, the devil would love to take us out before our time. Yeah. With solicitation of food. Listen, food's a big deal. And we'll talk about that more about Adam and Eve. Food is a big deal. If you can't control your appetite for food, it'll make you weak in other appetites. Oh, what are you talking about food? Let's go on here. Making me hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll talk about the advertisements in a minute, brother. Uh, he tries to exploit our natural appetites with the power of suggestion. <coughs> if you're the Son of God. If. And he says, the devil didn't, uh, didn't, he can't or make us do anything. He can only put an advertisement out there. And, and, and I, want you to, I, want, I want to talk to you about the avenues of way of his powers of suggestion. How, how does he come to us in all these various ways? Do you think he just comes to us again with food? No. He comes to us with all manner of suggestions. Let's turn to 1 John. I want you to keep your finger in Matthew because we're going right back here. My wife, she told me the other day, she really... Tore me up about. She said, "You need to quit turning so much scripture. We just get my mouth You know, so we're we're not going to turn to all that scripture this morning. We're going to stick right with Matthew and First John. I think last Sunday night we must have turned to twenty or thirty different scriptures. Are we there? Okay. Verse sixteen, chapter two, verse sixteen. Now these are the way. And listen, there's a lot of ways that people could preach and teach, okay? But if, if you walk out of a church service and all you did was shout and run, and you don't leave with something you can use during the week, when the devil comes against you, I hope you can shout and run. <laughs> I would rather have the Word of God. Because he has to go. He can't stand that. That's correct. Okay? We're going to see that you came here in a minute. Okay. For all this is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not... Somebody say it's not. It's not, it's not of who? The Father. The Father. Now, are you of the Father? So that tells me that i got something the world don't have. 
See, they fall to every solicitation and advertisement there is. There's no need. There's no cause. They have no power to stop themselves. Right? But we have a greater... We, we're more than conquerors. Greater than, than, than... It's He that lives in me than He that's in the world. I don't have to follow. I don't have to follow advertisements and temptations. But it isn't me. It's the Spirit that lives in me. It's the same Spirit that will quicken these dead mortal bodies one day and be raised from the dead. Amen. Now, how do I allow that Spirit to grow? Whatever you yield your members to is what you'll be like. You yield your members to Bible reading and prayer and fasting and study, and you'll find out that when that temptation comes, you know how to handle it better than if you just got off the TV or you just got out of the magazine we shouldn't be reading or if we're doing these other things that feed our minds and makes us weak. It does. Amen. It's a mindset. It's hard to have a mindset on Jesus Christ when you have a whole lot of junk in there. Okay, and the junk only gets in there by us allowing it or putting it in there. Actually, forcefully, we're force feeding our spirit to take on things that's not of God. Amen. Verse 17. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the Father, the will of the Father abides forever. Now, boy, that tells me something. Okay? First of all, in verse 17, Jesus knew this world was passing away. And to fulfill the lust would be like... I mean, to fill the lust of the flesh is, is, is like building your house on the sand. We read the story about that guy, didn't we? It'd be like, it'd be like making a $1,000 sandcastle right on the edge of the beach when the high tide was coming in. Or rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. Right? And it's, I, mean, it, I mean, I ain't talking about a ship that's just starting to sink. I'm talking about that baby's up like this and you're trying to hold on to the chair. Listen, this thing is passing away. This old world is passing away and the lust of it is passing away. We got some good news this morning. Man. That we don't have to worry about because we don't put our, we don't put our affections on things below, but we put our affections on things Amen. above. Amen? Yes. Yes. Amen. On heavenly things. We're getting hold of the heavenly things. Amen? Amen. Good. Thank you. I like what this word says. It says that to fill, fulfill the lust of the flesh will bring destruction. What will it bring destruction to? The plan that God has for you because of the way you feel about yourself inside. See, the, the, Jesus' blood covers all guilt and shame. We're set free from guilt and shame. You know that? And then when we get tempted, we fall down. The first thing we want to do, here comes the guilt and shame. First of all, He solicited us to be tempted, and then we fall into it. The first thing He does is come back to us and say, Look at you! You call yourself a Christian? That dirty snake, he ain't dirty. We know about his ways though, don't we? We know about how he lies. Yes, you call yourself a Christian. Yes, I made a mistake. Yes, I'll repent. And yes, I'll still be a child of God. Yes, he'll still fill me with his spirit. Yes, I'll still walk his paths. Amen. I won't quit. You, you may have hindered my plan. You may have got in the way of my plan a little bit. But you are not the plan, Satan. Amen. 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 I got a plan. <laughs> Jesus is God. Yeah. Amen. I love this. I want you to look. I, I want you to look at, at verse 17. Uh, down where it says after it passes away. It says, but he who does the, the will of God. Now listen, this is where we get an advantage. I want you to let this sink down. You want willpower? How about God's willpower? He's got willpower for you. To not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when we're tempted, instead of saying, instead of trying to make it a mind battle, oh, oh, no, no, I can't get it. No. Make it, make it a spirit battle. God, it's your willpower that I stand strong in this. I will not fall. I will not go down to Satan's solicitations. I'm going to stand up and prove what the blood and the power of the blood can do. Amen. Let's go back to Matthew, please. As you're turning back, I want to talk to you about what that word abide means. He who doesn't fulfill the lust of the flesh will abide. And every time you were to read this word abide, in the Greek this word means to continue and remain and dwell. That's good news, ain't it? We're going to abide, we're going to continue, remain, and, and dwell with the Father forever. Amen. Fulfilling the lust of the flesh has a key to this. Because I'll tell you what, if we continue to fulfill the lust of the flesh, pretty soon we have let sin separate us from fellowship with our Lord. And when we get there, then we... Where are we? We're 
we start feeling bad. Then the state comes to lie to us about what the blood can do. Oh, he would never take you back. You've done so much. That's a lie. It's his will that none perish. It's his will that we walk in his ways, in his pathways, in his life. Amen? Verse 2, he hungered. <clears throat> what in the world kind of what kind of temptation is hungry? He hungered. It's the lust of the flesh. Amen? Yeah. What is the lust of the flesh? It is wanting to gratify self. What is the lust of the flesh? I want to. I want to. I want it for me. I want just for me. Amen. I want. I just gotta have some of that stone bread. <laughs> I want it for me. But no, Satan. Jesus didn't fall to this. In verse three, it says, "If you are the Son of God." This, this word "if" translates to the word "since." Now I want you to listen to how they, how the, how the devil tries to, to turn what Jesus is doing. Now Jesus. He just got baptized, and what did the voice from heaven tell him? This is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. All heaven and hell and everybody standing around heard this. So what does Satan try to do? First thing, he comes to him. He don't say, "If you're the son of God," as in to question his authority or who he is. He come to him to say, "Well, since you're the son of God and you got all this power, that's the way it was said. Since you're so high and mighty, since you're the son of God." Turn these stones into bread. Could Jesus have done that? Oh yeah. He could. Wonder why he did. See, Satan was testing him. And Jesus was proving himself. It's an example for us. He said, I got a plan that's going to save people in the year 2000. I got a plan in my life and God wants me to fulfill that plan to the very T. Now if I change this stone, stone to bread, then all of a sudden, I'm taking care of all of my needs divinely and I'll get glory of men. How many of you would have fallen down and said, oh, he's the son of God. Look at him. He turned the stone to bread. How many? He says, I'll not take glory until I die on the cross. That will be my glory. Until I save all humanity from their sins. That will be my glory. You will not rob the Father of His plan. I will glorify Him in His plan. I will, I will live by His timetables. You will not have me to do anything before my Father says it's okay. Because I belong to Him. Amen? How about you this morning? Is your mind made up yet? And listen, you're, I, I know some of you are thinking about this. Amen? God wanting to do something with His Word to us this morning. Amen? Okay. Now, the reason that that uh, Jesus Jesus had just uh, he identified himself with human beings in uh, Matthew chapter three when he was baptized. Now, see, when he was baptized, it, it means more than what we get baptized for. We get baptized as death, the burial, and the resurrection. You're taking down the old man, and you're coming up the new man. Amen. That's what it means for us. But for him. He was sinless. What it meant for him is, I'm going to die and be buried, and I'm going to raise for these people. Now, when Satan came with his temptation of the lust of the flesh, what he was trying to do was disidentify him with us. Can you turn stone to bread? No. He says, I'm going to get the glory from my Father just the way he had a plan for it. And I'm going to do it just in his timing. And you will not steal or rob from these people in the year 2000. Amen. That's us. Amen. I'm glad he fulfilled his plan. Jesus would not satisfy God's plan by fulfilling the lust of the flesh. But he would do, it, he would do so by doing the will of his Father. By suffering on the cross. By raising from the dead. He would not fulfill the plan that God had for him. Uh, by by falling to uh, Satan's solicitation. Verse 4. <clears throat> but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, we, we need to understand, we, we see there's two, there's, two, there's two meanings to the word temptation. There's two meanings to the word word. There's two kinds of word. Now, some people pronounce it logos, and some people pronounce it logos. However you pronounce it, it's the same word. Okay? It says, 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Right here. He was the living, breathing message of God. Amen. Now, but we see Jesus Himself giving us ways to fight. The word He uses here is the word rhema. That, that means, you know, I'll tell you how rhema is going to act. You're going to leave here today and some of you are going to defeat temptation at every turn. Every turn. Every time Satan comes with advertisement, you're going to realize what he's doing and you're going to say, No way! Amen! Because the Spirit and the power of God has got your mind and in your heart and now you're allowing Him to operate in ways you never knew. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This rhema is what the Lord was using. This, this rhema is found in Ephesians uh, chapter four, uh, 6, verse 17, where it says, by using the word of the Spirit, which is the Spirit of the Lord, the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord. This rhema is used in time of need. This rhema is when you go out and you defeat Satan because you heard the word of God, that's rhema. And that's what Jesus was using right here. Rhema. Amen. He's defeated by the power of his word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Satan's defeated. Okay. Every time you use the word, every time you do the word, Every time you say the word, by His stripes we are healed. Every time a healing takes place, that's rhema. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 5 and verse 6. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, Since you're the Son of God, why don't you just throw yourself down? Where is it written? He shall give the angels charge over you. And in their hands he shall bear you up. At least you dash yourself up foot against the stone. Okay, in verse 6, this temptation, back to 1 John says, this is the pride of life. <laughs> now, now see, before we can understand why and how we're tempted, and then how to defeat the enemy in temptation, we have to understand it. We have to understand the meanings. We have to understand God's power in these things, and His will. What is His will in this? What is His will in my solicitation? Okay? The temptation to pride of life. This is an unholy ambition for self display and self glory. It is a total disregard for God's plan and His will. You think Jesus is going to fall in this one? Somebody's ready to put no one. Amen? Amen? By performing this sensational stunt, and that's what it would have been, jumping off. I mean, just think how many people. Here we go again. Satan is trying to get him to receive glory before it's time. That's what we're saying. Give glory. Give glory. He's raised from the dead. Give glory. He shed His blood. We're set free. Give glory. We were once lost and now we're found. Give glory. None of this could have happened if He'd have failed in this. Amen. Amen. He don't want us to fall either. He don't want us to have an unholy ambition for self-discipline. He wants to have His ambitions. Amen. He'll be glorified. We want to glorify our God in everything that we do. And I want to talk to you about this sensational. This word sens sensational comes from the word senses. Anything that tingles your sens senses a lot of times isn't the best thing we can do. Because see, we don't live by feeling, we live by faith. Hey, is that not right? Am I right? You notice the devil, he always operates in the sense realm. Boy, I'm hungry. Boy, that looks good. Boy, I'd like to make myself look better than what I am. It's like it puffed up and falling apart. See? He lives in that realm. We have to be careful about our senses. And we live, we live by faith. Faith. Mountain moving. Devil scaring. Overcoming faith. Amen. Okay. Um, this word comes from... Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, by performing this sensational stunt, we just went over that, that he would pass, he would bypass the cross and go straight to the throne. And this was not the plan of God. See, everything the devil tries to get us to do is trying to get us out of the plan. Once we get the plan all messed up, then we go to him and still come because he can take all that pieces of that plan and put it right back again because it's his plan. See, we mess up the plan and then we want to stay there and try to fix it like a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, God, here's your plan. 
And he says, no, let me make the plan. If you don't obey the plan, let me straighten the plan back out, and we'll do this till I come back. Until you overcome, until you overcome, until you grow in trials and temptations. Uh, and, you know, in, in your trials and temptations, whoever knows that we're like gold? That we're, we're like refined gold? Anybody ever hear that? You know how gold's refined? The heat. <laughs> Amen. The heat. The heat of what? Not hell. We don't have to worry about that. The heat of the solicitation. You know, and here Jesus was the first time he was tempted to turn the bread to stone. And, and sometimes we're tempted on the first round. And we get stuck into the fire. And you're saying, oh God, let me out of this trial. Instead of looking at the circumstances and saying, God, what is it that you want me to do here? There's something you want me to perform in this thing. And I'm, I'm just not seeing it. And I want to be caught up in where I'm at and what's going on. I want to be caught up in what you want me to do and what you want me to be and what you want me to say in this thing. Because I know there's a great purpose and, a, and, and there's a great thing that you want to have accomplished through this trial. You just don't have this in, in here to punish me. I'm your child. You're helping me grow. That's hard to look at it that way. Flesh says, oh, let me out. So he lets us out. And then he puts us back in. Just like Jesus. Right back into the trial again. You know why? The first time we get out, the finder gets the gold out and he scrapes all the impurities off. And then he sticks it back in the fire again. And the second time he pulls it out, he scrapes all the impurities off. We're going to go to the fire the third time right here. Verse 7. Jesus said to him, it is written again. Listen here, devil, here's some rain for you. <laughs> you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In verse 7, Jesus would not do things in his timetable, but he would fulfill God's timetable. He would not, he knew that the cross would come before his comfort. Jesus knew that. He'd come to do that. He knew the altar of sacrifice would not come before the throne. I mean, the altar of sacrifice had to come before the throne. And he also knew the crown of thorns would come before the crown of glory. If he would have messed up in any of this right here, which he could, because he was God. But see, that's our, that's our shining example. Praise the Lord. Now, now we want, what, how about our timetable? What's our timetable? N-O-W. Right now, Lord. Amen? We want it now. Let's wait for God. I'll tell you, it will be so much sweeter if we don't press things for God. If we allow Him to work the things that He wants to work in our life in His time. But during that time, we don't fall to seduction and sin. We will not allow the sin. We, we, we are the King's child. We obey Him. We don't obey the sin. Amen? Amen? It's true. You know what I think, It's true. Okay. Verse uh, 8 and 9. Uh, again, the devil took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I'll give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Now, how many times has the devil promised you something? It's through the lust of the eye. That's what this was. Listen, he didn't take Jesus up to the, uh, the pinnacle of the temple and show him the slums. It says that he showed... All their glory. They were glorious kingdoms. Was Satan really able to give God the kingdoms? Yes. He is the power of this air. He is the ruler of this world right now. Now, now get this. Jesus knew the future. Now, in Revelations, it'll be God giving Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Here, here the devil was trying to get give something to Jesus that he already had. Amen. That he's going to have in the future. Amen. He's trying to give Jesus something that he's ready. Jesus is ready to buy by. You see, if he would have took that kingdom at that time, why would he have to buy? He already had. See the timetable that, that Satan was ready to throw out of life, and and he keeps on using sins. Sins, you're, you know, you know. Come on, we've all been there. Since, since you're a child of God, you know God wouldn't care if you do that. You put whatever you want to where that's at. I'm not going to ask you what that is. But that's the way it works. But that will cause destruction. It will. And the lust of the eye. The things that we have unholy <coughs> desires. 
And if you look at something, something long enough, pretty soon it ain't long, you'll be wanting it. Amen? Yeah. I have a great temptation with my charge card. I mean, I love the bow hunt. I see a new bow on the market. And boy, my partner says, charge it, baby. Charge it! <laughs> I've been solicited. <laughs> but also, see, I know the consequences of that solicitation when I go home and tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'd be a whole lot more worried about facing God. Wouldn't you? Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. God's doing something here this morning. Praise God. Amen. A lust arises from what we see. Could the devil give Jesus these kingdoms? And I only, the scriptures are that he offered the, his, uh, his offer was valid. He is the God of this age. He's the prince of power of the air. Now, I want to show you something here. You know, when we stand up and worship, worship is so important. If we look at these next these verse and the next verse, because worship identifies you with who you belong to. Why did Satan want Jesus to fall down and worship him? It would, have, it would then take Jesus' identification away from you and me and his Father and give it to the devil. So when we worship God and raise our hands, you know who we're identifying with? I belong to you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. You're mine, Lord. I'll be with you forever, Lord. I worship you. I will not let nothing hinder my identification with you. Praise it's God. the only thing that I can give you that's worth anything is my praise. Amen. He don't need your money. He has all of it. He has, all, he has everything. Yes. He needs you. He needs you. He needs me. Amen. Amen. He needs us. we got a job to do. we got a plan to fulfill. we got a calling we've been called to. Amen. And all the Satan's demons... Are, are going to fall on these plans. They're under God's authority this morning. Okay. <clears throat> Verse uh, Revelation 19 and 16 says, All kingdoms will be the king of kings within God's timetable. So we see that here Jesus, Satan's trying to provoke Jesus into getting something that already belonged to him. You know, sometimes we do that too. Sometimes we got something come from God and we just press and press and press and press and press until we get it in the wrong manner. When God wanted to maybe have it gifted to us. We don't we don't went out and charged it and and somebody might have been feeling led to say, Hey, you know, I know the Lord's been speaking to you here. You know, and then all of a sudden the Lord quit speaking to that person because you just went out and charged that thing. I need a charge card this morning. Is that alright? Okay. <laughs> Listen, this is a serious issue. We're accountable for how we spend our money. You know, uh, most of the time when we're praying for the financial miracle, it's because we made some financial blunders. And charge cards are a big blunder for a lot of us. That's Amen. Amen. Charge cards and, and, and just like the guy that's praying for his heart. That's been eating <coughs> grease for 10 years. We bring things on ourselves by our choices that we make. We get solicited and make wrong choices. You know, every time we get solicited now, you can say, I'm going to prove the Lord. I'm going to prove the Lord. I'm going to prove the Lord in this solicitation. First 10. <clears throat> then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written. Oh, I love it. Get out of here. It is written, You shall, not, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him, you shall, him only you shall serve. And like we were talking about a while ago, uh, when you worship, when you truly get to worship, do you know you want to serve the Lord? Serving will become a hunger for you. As you hunger and, and as you worship, all of a sudden there will be desire to serve us with up in you. Amen. Because you're identifying yourself with the Father. All of a sudden you're identifying yourself with His plan for you. All of a sudden He's given you power to do things you wouldn't think you'd ever be able to do. Do you think I want to be here this morning? Actually, for the last three days my life's been burning. I'm scared to death. But I feel an anointing of the Lord this morning. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And He just canceled out that fear. I tell you, my flesh would just love to run out the door. But my spirit says, no, i got a plan for you that I want you to identify yourself with your plan and your calling. I want you to identify yourself with me, your Lord and Savior. 
Yes, Lord, that's me. I'll do what you want me to do. Well, it's a dangerous statement. <laughs> Except preach. <laughs> right? And, and, and most of the time we put the except in there, guess what? <laughs> I don't want to teach Sunday school. Well, guess what? Right? The very thing that we seem to run from is where the Lord wants to see. You know why that is? It's because I look at Moses and I see, I can relate, not because I'm like Moses, but that he said, Lord, can you find somebody else to do it? I just stutter. Lord, can you find somebody else to do it? You know, I don't talk well in front of people. I get nervous. I'm, I'm a rather quiet guy. And the Lord says, you go with my anointing and I'll make you like a piece of clay, just what I want you to be. Amen. Don't only work for me. Works for you. That's good news, man. I love the Lord that He's not a respecter of people. That He'll He'll do the same thing for me that He will for you, and do the same thing for you that He will for me. Amen. Amen. And I can look through His Word and I can see where He saves households and, and where people are healed by His touch. And I know that He still can do it, and He still does it. Amen. Amen. He'll do the same. He don't respect Moses or Paul or Peter any more than He respects you or you or you. What do you need? You need a shine and a passion. By how about the Holy Spirit? Let Him fall on you this morning. Amen. Let Him pass you by. Let Him let Him cover you, so you'll be able to go out and you'll be able to beat these solicitations. You'll be able to be the overcomer God called you to be, because that's in His plan. His will powers for you to succeed. Amen. Amen. So you, we can abide forever together with God. Amen. Now, I know I want. I'll just go over a few more things with you, and I'm going to let you go. Now, where do we get all this? We have the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and uh, the uh, lust of the eye. Now, where this all started was back in the garden. <coughs> you ever thought about that? Go ahead and eat the fruit. It's good for food. What happened? Here comes the solicitor, dressed as a snake. It might have been a snake. And he said, oh, Satan said, Look at it. It looks good. He said, yeah. It does. See? And what do they do? They fell to solicitation. Which caused sin to be born. And then the, the pride of life. If you eat of the tree, it'll make you wise. Listen to how cunning Satan is. He don't come and yell to you right off the bat, I'm Satan! I'm here to tempt you! <laughs> what he does is wait till you get halfway through and say, Surprise! <laughs> right? Yeah. Or wait till you get through it and you got all this guilt and shame all over and you don't know what to do with it. And, and he tells you the last place you want to go is right here. And this is the first place we ought to run to. Yeah. Did you know that Sunday morning too? When you lay in bed, you look at the clock and you snooze the button? Oh yeah. When the devil tells you you ought to sleep in, you ought to get up and run to church. God has something for you. Amen. 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 Sunday school church. We need to be in Sunday school. We need to hear God's word. We need to hear every ounce of what God has yes. put in our spirits. Amen. Okay? And then, oh, she saw that it was good, and boy, they were hungry. So what they did? They ate. And then here we go, passing the buck. Did you eat of the fruit? Snake told me to do it. <laughs> Adam, did you eat of the fruit? Eve told me to do it. <laughs> it's time we put blame where blame goes. That's right. Lord, I made mistakes. Lord, I failed. Now I want to be put back on your track and on your plan for my life. Amen. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Now Jesus, He was all points tempted just like we are. Yet, <coughs> He fulfilled every ounce of the Father's plan. Now, the first Adam, he felt a solicitation. Sin and destruction was born. The second Adam, he conquered temptation and righteousness was born. Thank God for righteousness. Thank God for what was born through Jesus Christ. Righteousness. So we can be saved. Amen? I want you to, can I get a piano player to come up on that? Thank you, Kim. I want you to bow your heads this morning.
I thank you for your prayers because I certainly can feel the Lord here this morning. Some of you might say this morning that you know that, that you know I really made mistakes and I messed up the Father's plan. And I really need to pray and ask the Lord to get me back on track and get his plan right back in my life. And some of you might need to pray and say, Lord, now that I understand your word, help me not to fall to solicitation, but help me test and prove your word. Help me prove your word. Every time the solicitor comes, help me prove you in my life. But most of all, I want to talk to the person if you're sitting here lost this morning. And listen only, man, you know that. You know whether you're lost. You know whether you know whether you're really right with God. You know whether if you if you went right now and met him face to face, you know whether your inventory's short. It's got to be covered by the blood. And I'm talking to you especially this morning because the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Now I'm going to ask you if you're lost this morning, and you and you would say, Brother Allen. I understand that God fulfilled all righteousness. That means he, he covered God's plan completely. He had a plan for me. He has a plan for salvation. He shed His blood for my sins. And I need that forgiveness because I, got, I need a Savior. I know I've made mistakes. I know i got sin in my life. And I want it covered by Jesus' blood. If that's you this morning, don't be ashamed. Because the devil right now is going to come with you at every lie that you ever heard. These people will make fun of you. They'll think you're foolish. But I'll tell you, these people are praying for you. These people, if you're sitting here lost, these people are praying that you'll give your heart to the Lord. So if this is you, don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand up and stand up for the Lord and say, this is me, Brother Al. I, I just, I want to get my life right. I want everything. When I stand before the Lord, I want everything covered. I want to be sure. This is, when you stand before the Lord, it's not a time to question whether you're ready. I want to stand before the Lord and say, I know I'm ready. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Amen. Amen. Is anybody here not ready? That trumpet's ready to sound. And we need to be ready. That's right. This is the most important decision you ever make in your life. Because it will mean eternity to you. Your hearts are clear. Okay. I really feel like somebody here, the Lord's dealing with somebody right here. Jesus fulfilled the Father's plan for salvation. The blood brings forth forgiveness and grace for those who receive it. He was tempted and bruised and beaten and hung and pierced. The plan of God is for you to be saved. That's for you to be saved. God's plan has been off track because I've been off track. Instead of putting God in control, I've taken control of my own life. And this morning, the Lord wants to put God's hand back in your life. He wants to put His plan back in your life. He wants to put you right back on the track where He once was. This message is for you. This message is for you. And I'm going to ask you if you'll come up and let, let us pray for you. You know, right here, man, Christians have a hard time right here. Man, if I get up there, everybody think I've been out doing this. Doing it. Don't worry what everybody thinks. Worry about what God thinks. If God told you to get up and walk. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. We won't fall to solicitation. Next time the devil comes to solicit us, we'll say no. We're heirs of the promise. We're joint heirs with God. I'm redeemed. The blood has bought me. I'm spirit filled. And I'm led by His Spirit. Amen. The next time temptation comes, we can say this, I'm ready to prove what God's blood and His Spirit can do.
The temptation of Jesus, we see the devil cannot attack though the devil can attack those who are spirit filled, but he is powerless against those who redeem who resist Satan. You know, even though you're spirit filled doesn't mean you won't be attacked. It means you have the power to resist. And as you resist, guess what Satan does? He's gone. He has to go. Amen? We learned something this morning, didn't we? If you did, say amen. amen. We, know, we know how to use raven. Amen? The, kind of, the, the powerful word of God like a weapon. Amen? Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this time together with your sheep. I pray, Lord, that your word went forth. I know it went forth, Lord, and done some things in the hearts and minds of your, your sheep, Lord, your people. I pray for my brothers and sisters here at this altar right now, Lord. I pray, Lord, the ones that have, Lord, they're going to stand up. This church, these people are going to stand up this week, and they're going to make a difference. Lord, they're going to make a change in their lives because they're going to stand up and say, I won't be solicited, but I'll be, I'll prove the Word of God to be true. I'll prove that spirit-filled Christians, by the power of God, can live a righteous life. I, I, I'll prove, Lord, that I'm dead to sin, and I'm not going to live to the lust of the flesh. Lord, but I'm going to, I'm going to desire you. I'm going to desire your ways and your plan in my life. Lord, I just thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you're doing in these hearts and lives today, Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for the plan that you fulfill in salvation and redemption. I pray, Lord Jesus, for the one that has sat here this morning and let an opportunity, Lord, pass them by to be saved. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would go with them, Lord, and continue. I know, Lord, you go out and look for them every day. Lord, but I pray that your spirit would be continuing with them, drawing to you. Lord Jesus, and I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We worship you. We honor you. Lord God, right now we just welcome you.